Welcome back, Richard. It's always terrific to see you, sir. Hey, good morning. Uh, anything significant? Oh, tax time. That's about all, right? Yeah. Income tax season. Tax time it is. <laughs> that always brings a little bit of uh, joy and excitement for everybody, just about as much as any other holiday, I think. Uh, right. <laughs> right? It's the beginning of the second quarter, right? April, March, June, February, March. Yeah, beginning of quarter two. It is. It is. Uh, so. Um, and, and today we are going to, um, it is another round, another episode focusing on education. And this may be the, the last episode in, in this particular series that we're doing, but, right. um, but who knows, you know, let's see how today goes and, and figure out where we go from there. Because, uh, you know, the more people that I talk to, and I'm sure that you, the same is for, true for you, the more people I talk to about this, uh, the more they want to hear and the more they want to, to talk about things. So, um, right. We'll see what happens. But over the past few weeks, we have talked about some of the concerns that we have with what's happening in education, um, especially as it relates to what's happening to teachers um, and, and the situations that they're finding themselves in and, and students. Right. You know, students are, goodness, students are struggling um, for a variety of reasons. Right. So today we're going to talk about, try to talk a little bit about what we feel is needed in the schools and maybe some directions that we can move towards making some change. Yeah, right. We're uh, middle of April, so we're headed into kind of heading into the end of the of another school year. Um, right. And good time to take stock and say, okay, where are we now? Um, how are we doing? Um, how are things going? Um, and so uh, there are a number. It's a, it's also an election year. So uh, and since the '80s, education has been a political issue um, during each election. So we have an election coming up. So schools are in the news again for that reason. People are talking about um, education. It's been a hot topic since the pandemic. And so uh, we wanted to take another look at this. Um, last week, we talked about teachers and vouchers, um, vouchers being a solution to a problem. But I think the question, <clears throat> question worth asking is, are public schools failing? There seems to be this feeling in the air that public schools have somehow uh, stopped working or they're somehow failing. So the question is, are public schools really failing? Um, no, no, but some pub, but some schools are failing. And I think that's the issue. Um, but some schools are failing. The problem is underperforming schools, if we want to call failing schools underperforming schools, have always been with us because under underperforming students have always been with us. Um, we can go back to 1967. Uh, Jonathan Kozel wrote a book called Death at an Early Age, which was about um, the education of poor Black children in Boston. Mm -hmm. And in 1991, he followed up with a book called Savage Inequalities that laid out the case that there are some schools that are very high functioning and some schools low functioning. So there's underperformance by circumstance, um, zip code, if you live in a poor area, no matter where you live, if you live in a, in a wealthy area, the schools tend to be better. If you live in a poor area, the schools tend to be worse. Um, mental illness is a circumstance that will affect school performance. Parental support is an issue. But there's also underperformance by chance, uh, by choice. And by that we mean, and, and we're really running into this uh, more and more today. There are some kids who just don't care. Uh, right. They don't care about their work. They don't care about assignments. They're not doing their work. They're um, using all sorts of things to avoid work. Nevertheless, we still have an obligation to those students. So whether it's circumstances, but whether it's circumstances or choice, we still have, have an obligation um, to educate all children. Okay? Right. And, and I think that the, the is, you, know, we, you and I had a, a great discussion about this yesterday. And, um, you know, in, in preparation for the podcast and everything. And, and it's, you know, it, it's not because schools are public or because, you know, as some will, will tell that they're, they're godless or that, you know, teachers are lazy or that, you know, it, it's not for these reasons that people seem to, to point to schools. It's um, they're struggling because 
since you know the 1960s, 1970s, schools are tasked with educating every child. So that's right. Every that's child right. from really from birth through 22 years of age up to their 22nd birthday are, are to be educated. And and right. because of that, it doesn't it doesn't matter where they come from, it doesn't matter what language they speak, it doesn't matter what their medical, developmental, emotional, behavioral, it does none of those things matter. Right. They the schools, public schools are tasked with educating them. And, and the reality is, is that not all schools are fully equipped to be able to do that. Not all teachers, as one can imagine, not all teachers are fully trained to be able to handle students with all of these right. difficulties. You know, mm -hmm. you have some teachers that specialize in different things, but they're tasked with, with educating all of these kids, but they're not necessarily supported in their efforts to do so. That's right. Um, Washington and Jefferson were were the first advocate, were early advocates of of um, public education for all. The idea was, if we're going to do this, we are citizens. If citizens are going to run the country, citizens have to be educated. So even back to the beginning of the Republic, the founding fathers uh, were all in on this idea that we will have free education for everybody, not just the wealthy who can afford tutors, and who could afford the the the, the, the uh, private schools, but we'll we will educate all children. That is a challenge that many countries don't take. That's a challenge that we have always faced in our country, and that's what makes schooling so difficult. Is that public schools are tasked with educating all children. It doesn't matter whether they have a mental illness, a physical illness, whether they have parental support, they don't have parental support. Schools have to educate all children. That's the first challenge. The second challenge, when we talk about what's really wrong with schools, is are today's schools, as they are currently structured, are they relevant? And we would say, for some students, they are. We have an IB program. We have AP classes. We have honors class. For those students, the schools are working pretty well. But that's about 30% of students. Um, for most students, the schools are not structured to meet their needs or to provide them what they want. We have factory schools. The, the schools that we have today are very much like the schools I attended when I was a child. And that was a very long time ago. Um, and these schools continue to, we're using factory schools to prepare students for a world that no longer exists. Right. Yeah. I, that was, I think, you mentioned in our, in this discussion I mentioned a minute ago. You 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 said that um, you referred to schools as factory schools, and I and I don't think that I had talked thought about it that way. That you know, schools the way that they're developed was they were very effective during the industrial age, during the time when we were training students to get to um, to a, a level where they can you know they were educated enough to vote and to to make some of those decisions, but then they were going to some type of work. They were going to some destination afterwards. And today it, it's it's so different because, uh, well, for, for many reasons, but if for no other reason, we just look at technology, you know, um, we, we've right. heard this before that something that the pandemic taught us, and we are not in any way saying that this is all the pandemic's fault or that this is rooted in the pandemic because all of this began before the pandemic came around. Um, but what one of the things that the pandemic really taught us was that um, tech, students use technology to learn the things that they want to learn. And mm -hmm. they realized that they don't have to be at school for seven and a half hours a day That's right. to, to mm -hmm. complete all of their tasks or to do what they're supposed to do. Even the students who were who are good students and who worked to uh, to do all of the uh, assignments and all everything that the teachers assigned to them. Even those students realize that I, I don't, it doesn't take seven and a half hours a day to do this. You know, and the other, you know, my grandchildren will take the same courses yeah. in very much the same way that I took them many, many, many years ago. These are not my children. These are my grandchildren. Right. Great grandchildren are, they're, they're going to a school early in the morning. They're staying all day and they get out at night. That's how factories work. They would open in the morning, 
you would do your eight hour shift and then you would go home. Mm -hmm. Today, learning occurs 24 hours a day. We have an internet, something called the internet. And you can be learning 24, you can be working, learning 24, all of us can be working and learning 24 hours a day. Our, my grandchildren are in a completely different world, and yet they're going to exactly the same kind of school that I went to. The same hours, the same bells are ringing, the same lunch periods, the same recess. It's all structured to work for a factory uh, on a factory model. So what are we doing for students who don't want that kind of an education? And what are we doing for students who can't do that kind of an education? Because the system as it's structured right now works only for about 30% of students. Right. So then the second problem is, what, it, what, what is it with today's students, Gen X, Gen Z, millennials? Once you start blaming the students, you start blaming the victims. The students in our schools are victims, and I use that term very, very gingerly. They're victims of a system that is no longer relevant to the world that we live in, okay? Exactly. Students are interested in learning. They're just not interested in schooling. They, they want to learn. They just don't want to do it the way we impose it on them. Right. And, and there, there, are lots of, there are lots of problems with this. Um, and, and perhaps that will be um, fuel for another, a, a different podcast, not necessarily um, immediately, but <laughs> this, uh, that'll be because they want to learn. They, they're not interested in schooling per se, but they're interested in learning. The, the problem, as I see it, is that the, the learning that they're doing is incomplete. They're, they're getting this much information and they're not getting the foundation. And so right. they look as though or act as though they understand something, but really they have no foundation for it. And so that, that's a problem that, that we'll have to address at different time because that's something that schools can and should bring about. You know, that's something that schools should provide. But the, the, we, we talk about this the same way as we talk about you know, the issue when people refer to kids as being lazy. We don't, we don't think right. that kids are lazy. Kids are very right. motivated to do what they want to do. Um, right. In the same way, kids are very interested in learning what they want to learn. They, they're, not, they're not interested in schooling. They're not interested in clocking in in the morning and clocking out in the even, evening. Right. Um, they want to learn. They, they want to get information. And, and if, you, if you doubt that, just ask them a question and they pick up their phone and they search for it and they they give you the answer. They don't mind. They can find it. They can find it in a hurry. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but this antiquated system that we have is right. you know is working within the constraints, as you said. You know that we, that's been around for you know a hundred years or more, and right. it's not. It's just <laughs> not realistic, really, for the way that life is today. Right. And the reform since the 1990s and the early 2000s, those reforms, and, and I would put vouchers into that, the efforts at reform, serve mainly to enhance the factory system. I mean, we were still on the same schedule. We're still teaching the same courses. We impose other expectations and constraints on teachers and schools, but it's, a, it's basically the same system. So we have a systemic, we have a system problem that requires system solutions right. and vouchers like high stakes testing and teacher accountability. None of these things are going to um, achieve anything close to us to a to be anything close to a systemic solution. Right. Um, and then, and so we talk about vouchers. And I, I, don't, I don't want to spend too much time beating up on vouchers, but there are two things that I would say. One is. If you have if you have school choice, and that's a big buzzword today, we have to have school choice. You help one student or one family, but that's not a solution for a system problem. Right. Helping one student or one family still leaves an underperforming school. They're es they're escaping the the idea with school choice is I'm going to escape an underperforming school. You take your kid out of there, you still have an underperforming school that somebody has to manage and deal with. Right. Second thing is if vouchers were benign, if 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 you said, look, we're going to do this, and but they're not benign because you're taking money out of the public school system. And that's a huge problem that we can't go into today. But you're taking money out of the system. So they're not benign. They're, they're, it's not just an advantage because if you're giving this money to this student, you're taking it away from that student's school. 
So these aren't benign. There's it's not an even chain, an even exchange here. Right. right. And, and we we kind of touched on that last week because you know, why are we vouchers mm -hmm. solve the problem, as you just said, solve the problems for individual students and families. But it, but it's also at sort of at the same time saying we're okay with the fact that they that there are underperforming schools because we're not doing anything to fix the school. We're not doing what? anything to fix that system. We, what we're doing is we're just saying, okay, you recognize that this school is a problem or that the school has a problem. And so we're going to let you go somewhere else. Why aren't we fixing the problem? And the other thing, the other question is, we can use Florida or Arizona or Ohio, or it doesn't matter what the state is. If you have universal vouchers, if you if you just extend it logically, right? If you take all the students out of all the underperforming schools, you close all those schools. People say, "Well, they should close. <laughs> let's close. Let's close all the underperforming schools." Mm -hmm. You still have all these students who have to be someplace. Right. <laughs> so, so aren't you just recreating a whole school system? You still have thousands of students who have to be educated right. in buildings with teachers according to state guidelines right so the logical extension of vouchers is you simply recreate the whole system but everybody's bouncing around with their eight thousand dollar check right but you still don't have enough you still don't have enough places for all the kids who might want them right and i don't know if you you have richard but i, I have yet to see or read about a system where vouchers were effective in, in revamping the entire system. It, it, it don't think they, they're for, not for one student or you know a handful of students who who went to or were able to get into some of these other schools. But when it comes to a systemic level, I have not yet heard of a of a place where vouchers were implemented and things Im improved for everyone. Yeah, there there's some research and it depends who's doing the research because there's research that says oh, everybody gets better when when we have vouchers, and, and it simply cannot be true. And, and I I would invite and I would invite anybody to come on this program, and convince me that vouchers make things better. They make things better for some students. They still leave underperforming schools. They vouchers cannot, by definition, and by performance and by function, vouchers are are not intended as a solution for underperforming schools. Right. They, they don't address the problems of underperforming schools. Right. They simply transfer students to other schools. Right. Now, at some point, the other schools are going to say, well, no, you really don't fit here. You know, We can't handle kids who have explosive outbursts in the classroom. Right. So there is this acceptance problem that we're going to run into with vouchers. Where, where do we send those kids? No school is going to volunteer to take a, a problem child, a right. child with behavior problems or emotional disorders. Right. You're not going to volunteer for that if you're trying to have a high performing school. Right. Be because and, and we'll, we'll move on to what we what we need to figure out as to be to be the actual solution. But, you know, you're, you're, you're right. <laughs> like the, the, when a school is underperforming, there's only a couple, there's only a handful of reasons why a school could be underperforming. Right. Okay. It's either the students, mm -hmm. it's the teachers, mm -hmm. or it's the re it's like the, the resources and support and, and those kind of it's, it's gotta be one of those things, right? I mean, mm -hmm. okay, so we're gonna take the strong students out, the students whose parents can and, and will use the vouchers to get them to go to another school, okay. We, we, if we're saying it's a student problem, the, the rest of the students are still there. If we're saying it's a right. teacher problem, why don't we train teachers? Why don't we support the teachers? Why don't we give them what they need and make sure that we're hiring, you know, good, strong teachers? Okay, right. that fix the problem. And, and pay them and pay them what they're worth. Right. <laughs> or it's a system issue and we need to put resources into the school, but yet we're creating a system where we're taking resources out of this, out of it. So, it's whatever we want to look, whichever the, the target that we have for dealing with the problem, vouchers don't help any of those things. Vouchers That's right. don't fix any of those problems. Right. High stakes testing didn't fix those problems. Account teacher accountability didn't fix those problems. 
these are not solutions for the problems that uh, teachers, public, uh, any school is struggling with. Uh, they, they just aren't the. That's why they're not working. They're they're good intentions, but they just aren't the solutions we need. Right. Um, so, what is the is there a solution out there? Okay, um, we're not going to change the structure of public of of any school anytime soon. We have a few Montessori schools, and we have a few educational alternatives, but. Um, moving this entire system at, at a national level is going to be is going to be a long slow process, but there are solutions. And one of them uh, we found in an article in, in Forbes of all places, which is not a liberal bastion by any means, but um, but it was written by Brandon uh, Busty, and he worked at one point for Kaplan, the the educational company. And there are a couple of quotes that we found, and we posted this. Uh, this article um, in the show notes, but it's things like standardized testing. We all remember standardized testing, the high stakes testing, end of year tests, and a standardized curriculum. If you have to take this and you have to take this and you have to take this, have led to teacher disempowerment because the test and the curriculum became important. And the idea was we wanted to create teacher proof um classrooms teacher proof education there is no such thing and this whole idea of accountability is the factory system we're gonna we're gonna watch you and we're gonna monitor you and we're gonna monitor your time we're gonna monitor your 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 abilities and that's simply that that kind of accountability we're not counting chips we're not putting bags into boxes that's not how education works. So accountability works in a factory system. It doesn't work in a, in a, in, a, in an educational system. Yeah. And, and you know, if you remember back, it, it wasn't all that long ago. The, the idea, one of the great ideas that they had was, you know, let's, let's help students who are, are a bit transient, who are going to change schools and go from place to place. And so not only was it a standardized curriculum, but it, it was a standardized, like, day-to-day -day curriculum where... The, the idea right. was all, you know, eighth grade um, ELA teachers needed to be working for, or, or let's use math, all eighth grade math teachers had to be on the same page in the same book every day. So if right. you were in, you were in a, a middle school uh, on the east side of the county, you, you were on page 78. If you were on the west side of the county in a middle school, you were on page 78. So that no matter what, if you had to change schools for some reason, you would pick up and you'd be right on the same page um, in the same place. On the surface, once again, as with so many things, on the surface, that sounds terrific. That sounds like a great idea because that's that's consistency. But there is no way, I, I don't know how anyone with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be mean and say, I don't know how anyone with half a brain could, could <laughs> believe that that is realistic. <laughs> there is just no way that you could say that every eighth grade class math classroom in, in a county with thousands of students, that every classroom could be on the same page at the same time on the same day. There, right. there is no way that anybody can truly believe that that's realistic. But that was, can, that was the goal. That was the solution that they came up with. And I can absolutely guarantee that that solution was not recommended by teachers. Right. Who were actually doing the teaching. The, right. the ones who were tasked with doing this, they're not at, they're not advocating for that kind of thing. Right. Because there is no, because there's no room to wiggle if a, if you had a couple of students out one day and they come back the next day, they just missed yesterday. That's it. You, you, you're not allowed to review it because you have to go onto the next pages so that you can right. stay on task with everybody on, on track with everybody else. There's just right. no way that those things can work. And it's the same thing with a standardized curriculum and with standardized testing. There's no way that anyone can realistically assume that or believe that everyone can be ready at the same time on the same day to take the same test, no matter where you live, no matter what's going on, no matter what school you go to. Right. right. There's just nothing realistic about that. Right. And that's one of several reasons why Busty in this article keeps hammering away at this idea that teachers of all of the professions are experiencing the highest rates of burnout and stress. Right. And half of all teachers, listen, think about this, half of all teachers are looking for another job. Right. And they're missing millions of days of work each year because they're burned out, because they're, they, this all this pressure from the top down 
first of all, they're denigrated, they're abused, they're not supported, they're not paid well. And now we have this second, uh, what I call the assault on teachers coming from mainly from, it's coming from parents, it's coming from elected officials, it's coming from inside the establishment. We are now threatening teachers with disciplinary action. So right. not only do we not support them, not only do they not have a voice, now we're saying, we're going to keep an eye on you and we're going to punish you if we catch you doing these things, such right. as in Alabama, if a teacher makes somebody feel guilty the, the, about anything, that they can be prosecuted, they can be fired. If a teacher has the wrong book in a classroom, yeah. In Florida, if a teacher refers too many students, too many disruptive students to the office in New Orleans, these are real laws on books in states that are affecting teachers. Right. The other thing is that if educational policy is left up to elected officials, to governors, to um, houses of houses and senates, uh, elected officials, if they're making policy that policy is going to ref reflect their bias. This is why we have a Department of Education. Departments of Education are, are professionals that should be insulated from political influence, and they develop policies, and then the legislature provides the resources for them to do those policies. Right. Well, now we have legislators making policies, right. talking about library books, talking about teacher accountability, talking about curriculum, talking about discipline. Right. That's not coming from departments of education who want best practices. That's coming from elected officials who have their own biases. Right. And the problem with that is that if educational policies are driven by social or political or religious beliefs, then every election cycle, you're going to have a new set of policies. Right. So th this election cycle, we may add the Ten Commandments to every classroom. The next election cycle, will I'll remove them from every classroom. Right, right. I'll and, eliminate. I will limit what you can discuss when the next election occurs. Well, I'll allow everything to be discussed. Right. I, I I've never worked in a system besides the educational system that that swung that where the pendulum swung as greatly as it does. Right. Um, education. It, it it is, you know, th there's no. So often there is no in between, um, and and you know whether it's standardized testing, whether it's how we identify students um, who who have special needs, whatever it is, um, the pendulum swings from one extreme to the other extreme mm -hmm. very quickly. You know, right. well, we'll say very quickly, relatively speaking. You know, it's not like the next day, but before you know very you know very quickly from the perspective of education you know within a year um it will change and so it, it's it, it makes no sense that we focus on as you just said the letting the political system drive this the the educational departments of education mm -hmm. uh, you know i like that idea of them being sort of insulated from the political structure so that they can make decisions that are most appropriate for students most appropriate right. mm -hmm. from a developmental, from an educational, from an emotional and a behavioral perspective. Mm -hmm. That's what needs to be driving the system, not not the politics. Right. There's a there's a there's a cry right now. There's this there's this um, fervor that we want to eliminate liberal thinking from schools and universities. Right. Well, yeah, that's what you want. Now, what if I want to? I get elected and I eliminate conservative thought. Is, is that the way we should be doing this? No, no, the, the, we should leave these places alone and they shouldn't be at the, at, uh, at the behest of whoever happens to be in political office at the time. Um, I will punish teachers to allow certain books. Mm -hmm. I will punish teachers if they don't allow them. Yeah. That's not how the system should work. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be available 
for a loud voice or an elected official because the elected officials are going to change with every election cycle. It's inevitable. And so we can't allow the public schools or, or any of our public institutions, we can't let the policies be determined by the elected officials. It, it just, it's, it's, it's not working. We've tried it and it doesn't work. Right. So, so we want to win. we want to give our two cents here, Doctor yeah. Benny. Well, okay, so we, we two cents are, or four cents, whatever. Yeah. Um, right. Right. Um, you know, we believe that you know schools that are orderly, schools that are, are um, you know where education can thrive. That we believe that that is what helps create a healthy educational system. Obviously, right. Schools need to be orderly. They need to be able to thrive. They need to um, be able to provide students with the education that they need, that mm -hmm. those students need. You know, right. yes, it can be a, a sort of set of expectations that students at this grade level will, will learn these, mm -hmm. these um, concepts, but to give the teacher and the school some, some margins of error, some, some latitude to do that so that, right. so that schools can be those places that are orderly and where education can can thrive. And whatever gets in the way, you eliminate. I mean, if cell phones get in the way, then eliminate them. If um, costumes, if kids want to come in and wear costumes, if that gets in the way of education, if it's a distraction, then you get rid of it. But you have to know what you want. You have to know what you want your schools to do. And then anything that gets, but that shouldn't be determined by politicians. It should be determined by educational experts, mainly teachers, all right? So this is what schools should be. What schools can't be? Schools can't be places where, um, schools can't be mental hospitals. Uh, I, I think we've tried that experiment. Um, they cannot be places, we're gonna have to figure out what to do with the students who don't fit into this educational right. system. We're, we're not doing that right now. We're dumping those kids in classes and we're saying, well, do the best you can. We're right. telling the students, we're telling their parents, and we're telling the teachers, just do the best you can. That's not good enough. You, you, that's not good enough. We have to do better with these students who don't fit. Absolutely. We also think that there should be, again, absolutely a, a common core set of essential skills that kids mm -hmm. learn sort of sequentially um, from kindergarten through middle school. Yeah, right. you know, those are the, the that, that's the stage, those are the stages of development where core skills should be gathered, should be mastered right. um, during that time frame. Mm -hmm. Then we differentiate high schools to right. prepare students for where they're going from there. Right. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we, we still, in that factory system, we still work from the idea that all students are going to do the same thing. You know, high mm -hmm. school was created to prepare students for college. You know, right. in the factory system, most education stopped in middle school. Right. Um, That's right. High schools, those that went to high school were those that were going to go to college. You know, mm -hmm. there's a large percentage of students who will not go to college, will not right. finish college, we'll say. Um, yeah. So why right. are we still forcing them through a system that says that that's what they're going that's what they're going to do because it's just not realistic right mm -hmm. so we need that's to have right. differentiation right and then the last thing is we have to have alternative placements that aren't just punishment systems right, right now what we have is if you don't make it if you can't make it we expel you or we kick you out okay and then we kick you out to uh failure uh, to the to the uh, to the we kick you out that you can't just kick kids out. And the other thing is, or we put you in centers that are essentially prison like atmospheres where you don't get educated, you don't get trained. You're there because you failed in the system. You're not there to do anything. You're there because you failed in the factory system. Yeah. There should be placements that aren't designed just as holding pens for the failures. There should be places where the kids who don't fit in the in the schools as they're presently structured, where these kids can also find a place to have some success and to be educated and trained um, so that they're not just, you kick a kid out of school, what are you kicking him to? You're kicking him to gangs, you're kicking him to the street, you're kicking him to, to wherever they end up. 
you know, yeah. when you, once you gonna, kick them out of school. I was going to say, those kids that you kick out into those systems, they still become adults and still live in your community. So right. do you want them right. to be educated or do you want them to just be prepared for a life uh, of, of that type of behavior? It's right. it, it seems logical that we would change those portions of the system, but we've been very resistant. Yeah, there's, there are a lot of temptations out there for kids who get kicked out of school or who fail yeah. out of who fail school. There's a lot of people waiting for them. Yeah, absolutely. and I'm not sure that we want to perpetuate that system. So we need to have alternatives that do more than just punish kids for failing. Absolutely. No. So our, that was, those are our two cents. We know that this is, this change isn't an overnight change. We know that this isn't easy, um, and we know that it's going to. It's a systemic change, though. It's a change that has to start in the in the capital. It has to start in you know in those departments of education. It has to start from the top and, and work its way down because that's the way that our system is right now. You know, it would be great. You know, we talked about charter systems the other day uh, or the other week. It would be great if we developed a charter system that demonstrated that this was an effective way to educate kids. And they right. took every student, they kept every student and they said, this, we're gonna make it work. We're gonna demonstrate a program that works because we are working with students, not with the, a this antiquated system. Um, right. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see a charter school that prepares kids who aren't in, who are not going to go to college. Right, you, you have to be a charter high school for kids who don't plan to go to college. What right. would that look like? Right, absolutely. Yeah. You know, they, they graduate high school with vocational trade certificates, and you know they're ready to right. go to work when they finish. So, right. Mm -hmm. Well, th that's it for today. Um, we we are probably going to jump onto some other topics starting next week, but um, it's been interesting over these past few weeks focusing on education, and we will certainly talk more about education in the future because um, there's always something to talk right. about when it comes to schools. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, that is it for today. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.